Well, um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Nestle Nutrition and, and Natalia uh, for um, organizing a, a meeting on human milk which, and um, putting us together. Thanks a lot. Also thank uh, Christine. I don't know if she's here because I think she managed very well all the organization and that was really great. And I think um, it's a very hard task now, talking now. I think everyone is a little bit exhausted. And um, I will try to uh, maintain you uh, certainly alive and maybe interested. And um, I may ask you some questions, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Sharon has asked me uh, to talk about early life nutrition and uh, immune development, so I have already restricted to gut immune development, because otherwise it's really wide. It's already widening my topic of interest, because usually I'm focusing on impact on of antigen, so thanks to you, I have now um, done a much better review of literature on that, and I will try uh, to uh, see what can we uh, uh, take uh, as message from the research done in mouse model. So there are beautiful studies uh, that are done, mechanistic analysis that are done in mouse model, mainly in adult mouse model, showing impact of nutrition, very few on early life, but I think it's hard to uh, use the data in the mouse and bring them to the human. So I will try to uh, do that, and you will see that often I will replace the mice by a, a beautiful lactating woman, and this is already over-interpretation, but uh, these are more hypotheses to stimulate a discussion today at 4.30, and probably uh, earlier or later for many people here. So, um, just to start and, and show you where I'm based now, I'm, I moved from Brussels to south of France, where I discovered the, the very good quality of life on French Riviera, and then I was proposed to get a new position at UWA, now on the ocean, which is, uh, I think, an upgrade and uh, University of Western Australia is a wonderful campus, which of course very well known already research in the field of human milk, as uh, the, the group of Peter Hartman is there, the group of uh, Donna, uh, Donna Geddes now, also um, um, Debbie Palmer, Susan Prescott, having wonderful cohorts. So there is lots of work that can be done also with Karen Seymour on, on IQ. So I'm discovering uh, the new environment and I think it will really be great. And I'm happy to get there with a nice person you will see. I know them for a long time and I'm very happy they, they follow me uh, that far. So go back, let's go to the question of uh, today, and is what is the impact of early life nutrition on gut immunity and long-term health? So why do we think that gut immunity is important for health and disease? Um, I think it's hard also to talk to you now about immunity because many people are refractory to immunology, but I will try to make it simple because it is simple. In fact, in the, in, in the gut, you, you have a physical barrier, the gut epithelium, which is now considered much more than a physical barrier. It's part, we can say, of the immune system because it produces molecules on both sides. To the liminal sides, it produces antimicrobial peptides. It produces mucus, which, of course, will affect uh, certainly the microbiota and the capacity to invade. It also produces on the luminal sites a um, molecule that will uh, interact, uh, communicate with the immune cell underneath. And we, which are those cells? Those cells are T lymphocytes that can be differentiated in many different uh, uh, classes with different effector function or regulatory function. In the recent years, you, said, you probably have heard about the innate lymphoid cells that just look like a lymphocyte, but that do not have antigen specificity, but they react extremely quickly and have a different function that are parallel to the T cell uh, function, uh, except that the innate lymphocytes 
uh, in lymphoid cells with regulatory function have not been identified yet. Of course, you have dendritic cells that con control activation of immune system and local monomacrophages that can um, reinforce and uh, response that have been induced. So this is uh, all about gut immunity. So what is, uh, how is this gut immunity uh, controlled? In fact, there are, as I was telling you, some factors that are produced that can ha be important for immune homeostasis when you don't have any infection, any uh, inflammatory response. And this is mediated, for instance, by TGF-beta production by epithelial cells, and IL-10 secretion by macrophage or by T lymphocytes, as well TGF-beta by lymphocytes. And those innate lymphoid cells are important also in homeostasis because they can induce uh, the production of repair molecule by epithelium cells, and in particular, IL-22 is very important to maintain a good gut barrier. And retinoic acid production from uh, retinal by dendritic cells, but also epithelial cell, mesenchymal cell, is also controlling immunity. And this is not only a local affair, it's something that will have uh, um, impact on systemic immunity. And this is the base of oral tolerance. You eat an antigen like egg, at least the mice, and probably the human, and then locally in the gut, you will induce regulatory cells that will migrate it in the circulation. They will go back to the gut, but also will disseminate in the body and this, there, thereby induce systemic tolerance. So this is when everything is going well. But uh, we also know that if you have uh, uh, altered immune response and in inflammatory immune response in the gut, you can also have systemic and, of course, also local inflammatory reaction. So locally, abnormal uh, Im immune response in the gut, meaning less, um, not correctly regulated, can lead to food allergy, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease in, in, in the colon, but also response that have been um, induced in the gut can have impact on cardiovascular disease, obesity, and this is mainly supposed to be mediated by metabolites produced by the bacteria. So now we, you know everything about gut immunity in the adult. And we go now to the early life. And uh, of course, uh, you know the theory of uh, Barker based on in utero uh, observation epidemiological study. I think uh, Alan yesterday also certainly insists on the importance of early life and what is early life. Uh, it may be also the life of your grandmother that is the early life because we know more and more that there is transgenerational transfer of uh, information. So um, I will mainly focus on this and mainly focus on how this period is important and how breastfeeding can help to make the child become autonomous and I will restrict this again in the field of uh, gut immunity. So how breast milk is impacting on gut immune development so that the neonate has a gut immune function that is not dependent anymore on the factors bring that breast milk that you all know are, are very important for mucosal immunity. And so how, what do we know about gut immune development? In fact, we know very few things. And um, people think they know because their friends, the people, I mean, many researchers think that they were, when they analyze an adult germ-free mice, they have a neonate mice. So many researchers describe the immune system of a neonate by the analysis of an adult germ-free mice. So this has been done during years and years. And in the recent in the five, last five years, there is now the fashion about looking at the early life, and some studies are, are getting done. So what we, we, we know, and both in the human and in the mouse, is that the barrier at birth is not completely um, um, functional and that you have a more permeable gut in early life. In the mice also, you have not well-developed crit and villi, and what do we know about the cells in the gut? 
not much. And again, many extrapolation. Everyone thinks that the neonate is susceptible to torrents. This is because um, Medawa showed that uh, uh, the neonate can be terrorized, but this was by systemic administration of an antigen. Orally, this is not the case, and I will come back to that. So the neonate has in its mucosa, and that has been shown in the human also, the, in the mucosa you see many naive T cells, and you have many regulatory T cells, and probably also TH2 cells. About the innate lymphoid cells, um, you don't know much about. You just have a few papers on one population, the ILC3, and those cells, the ILC3, are important to drive in lymphoid organ development because they interact with stromal cells, and this will lead uh, to the formation of lymph nodes. So what we can conclude from a study in the neonate is that there is a leaky gut barrier. There are poor effector mechanism and also poor tolerance mechanism. Then there will be a maturation, and we will go on that. That leads to a full uh, capacity to, to, in optimal condition to, uh, to mount specific response adapted to the situation, memory T cell, and various kinds of immune response, and also, of course, draining lymph node, uh, mesenteric lymph node, but also payer patches where the induction of immune response is uh, induced. So uh, now the question of today is what is driving that maturation? So there is certainly the gene that are, of course, that there is a developmental pathway, there is a programming, uh, genetic programming of gut immune development, and also there is certainly a role for microbiota. Why do we think there is a role for microbiota? That's because of the use of these famous germ-free mice. You take an adult germ-free mice and you compare the immune system with a mice which has a microbiota. And then you find in those adults that if they do not have a microbiota, they have increased IgE, they have a defect in tolerance, they have defect in Th1, Th helper 17, they are very susceptible to allergic disease. So from all that, you conclude that the microbiota is important to downregulate Th2 immune response, is important to uh, favor oral turns and mount very various immune response. And you also see that the size of the lymph node organs are very reduced when you don't have microbiota. So that has been done by taking an adult mice, putting back bacteria, and you see what's happening. And uh, some researcher, and in particular Rick Bloomberg in the U.S., has analyzed um, what's happening if you colonize a mice when adult or when neonate. And he found that, in fact, you can uh, decrease the IgE by colonization only if colonization happens before four weeks of age. And this settle the, illustrate the perfect windows of opportunity that we talk about in the clinical trial, in epidemiological study. And this is really exemplified in the mice that only during a very limited period of time, bacteria can have that impact on IgE. And then uh, of the next question is how bacteria are impacting on um, immune development. And uh, there is uh, still from the same group uh, data showing that the PS uh, sugar from Bacteroides fragilis is uh, involved in this down regulation of IgE and also NK T cells accumulation. So that's what we know about one way that microbe drive immune maturation. There are many other, but this is not the, the topic of today. I, it's not, certainly not my expertise. And I will talk more about how diet is impacting on gut immunity and how diet is impacting on gut immune development by acting through bacteria first. So uh, the diet, as uh, you, you all know, uh, many of the part of our diet can be metabolized by the bacteria in our gut. And what are the main um, factors that have been studied in the mice? So uh, in the adult mice, again, uh, mice can be fed with, uh, not bread, but with dietary fibers. And the, 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 the works from Atahashi uh, and others have shown that those fibers, dietary fibers, complex sugar, will be metabolized by Clostridia. 
and this will lead to short-chain fatty acid, propionate, butyrate, acetate, and these metabolites can act on epithelial cells, stimulate TGF beta secretion, you remember it's important for immune regulation, and uh, also act on cells, which will lead to immune regulation, so IL-3 that will produce IL-22, important for gut uh, repair mechanism and antimicrobial peptide secretion, T-reg differentiation, and also IgA secretion by uh, B cells. And at the end, enriching the diet of um, adult mice with uh, non-digestible fiber will prevent allergy and colitis. And another very well-studied um, metabolite produced by bacteria are the indole derivative that are produced from, uh, by, in particular by lactobacilli that can metabolize protein-based diet containing tryptophan into those indole derivative. And this can bind to aryl hydrocarbon receptor, also binding dioxin. And this is expressed on those famous ILC3 also called lymphocyte tissue inducer cells. And so these ILC3, as you may remember, I could have asked it, are important to, uh, develop, for the development of lymph node organ and also for the production of uh, uh, cytokine involved in tissue repair. So we see that the bacteria colonizing an adult can act by molecule in the surface, can act by metabolizing diet, in particular what has been studied much is metabolism of fibers and metabolism of protein leading to short-chain fatty acid and indole derivative. derivative. And so now let's go to the neonate. So for the one that are not familiar, this is a one-day-old uh, neonate. Looks like a preterm, but is uh, already very dynamic. And however, it will not receive bread, no ba protein-based diet, has no, not, uh, ba no bacteria, or very few bacteria in its gut. So how can you extrapolate what is known from an adult mice to this neonate? And of course, the answer and the magic come from uh, human milk. <laughs> so breast milk uh, is even more magic than I thought before when I prepared all that. Um, because we don't, a neonate doesn't eat bread, in fact, the, ma the mother will make a surrogate, I think, of dietary fibers in the breast milk, which are the oligosaccharides. And uh, those human milk oligosaccharides can be transformed by uh, the bifidobacteria into short-chain fatty acids. So although a neonate is not supposed to receive uh, non-digestible fiber, it has, however, the capacity to receive short-chain fatty acid because the mother will make a surrogate for it. And also, the neonate has no, 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 not developed microbiota at birth, but as I think uh, Erika will discuss after, mother milk is bringing its own microbiota and fact, uh, immunomodular factor and antimicrobial factor that will affect the bacteria and certainly will favor the, the differentiation and the growth of those bacteria. And so that's one way. And for the indole derivative, there has been a, a science paper published by uh, Gomez de Aguero from the uh, Macpherson group, and showing that, in fact, the maternal microbiota uh, in the gut will produce some indole derivative that will be transmitted to the breast milk. And so the baby also received the indole derivative coming from the ma mother microbiota. So in addition, the Ig, IgA and IgD from the mother are important for transferring this indole derivative and ensure the, the function of uh, activating ILC3. So I, I don't know if you find that magic, but I, I find that really <laughs> magic. And uh, so... Uh, after this little uh, thing. Uh, now uh, we come more to uh, the, the research my team has been conducting for 10 years, is how the diet can directly impact on immune development and gut immune development. 
So in, instead of going through metabolization by bacteria, can the diet directly impact? And I will focus on certain molecules, will not review everything. So um, I don't want you to die. So, and this is not my expertise, certainly. So uh, the cruciferous uh, vegetable, like um, broccoli, cabbage, contain indole derivative that can, uh, in absence of bacteria, have the same role and stimulate AHA receptor. And as you remember, uh, prevent uh, some infection and inflammatory response in the gut. And also, uh, we heard uh, this morning from uh, Ardit uh, Moreau that vitamin A is important, is found in breast milk, and uh, but here in the adult, there has been many, many work in the recent year on impact of vitamin A on gut immune regulation, and what we can summarize is that vitamin A uh, given to, uh, orally is important for T cell homing and B cell homing. So the T cell that activate in the lymph node, they have to go back to the gut to exert their function. This is dependent on vitamin A. They are, vitamin A is also very important to uh, amplify immune response, either regulatory immune response, but also inflammatory immune response, such as T helper 17. And vitamin A <coughs> is also very important, again, for this famous ILC3. And if you don't have uh, vitamin A in the diet of an adult mice, they have much more, much less ILC3 and much more ILC2 and are very susceptible to allergy. So that's a, in, a, still in, in the adult. And um, a more recent paper also published in Science analyzed the role of antigen, dietary antigen. So you know that you have million, billion of bacteria in the colon, also in the small intestine. But small intestine is certainly exposed to another source of antigen. These are the ones coming from the diet. So the, with the mice, it's nice. You, you can do... Uh, very precise thing. So they took mice that have uh, that are total that are germ free, so they have no microbial antigen, and they also took other mice that have no bacteria and, in addition, have an amino acid diet. So they have no intact protein. They check the nutrient composition is correct, and so those mice are called uh, antigen free. So though they have no microbiota and derived antigen, no diet derived antigen. And by combining these analyses, they found that the antigen uh, arriving from the food in the gut are important for the pool of memory T cells and for regulatory T cells in the small intestine. So germ-free mice, well, bacteria is important for T reg in the colon, and dietary antigen are important for uh, regulatory T cells in the small intestine. And certainly you understand the importance of this in the context of children that have allergic disease, and severe allergic disease, and sometimes they are given amino acid formula. So on the short term, this may be good, but in the long term, this may really impact on the capacity of the gut immunity to have regulatory immune response. So this is a, a comment. So amino antigen derived from uh, the diet are important because uh, they, they increase the pool of regulatory T cell and the tone of regulation in the small intestine. And probably uh, we could also uh, refer to a, a study published by the Pasteur group showing that diversification of the diet in the first year is associated with more regulatory cells and prevention of allergy. Uh, this may be something that is a, um, a parallel to what is found in the mice. And now what about the specific antigen? This certainly you all know that having introduction of a food antigen um, by oral route can induce uh, antigen specific tolerance, meaning that if you eat egg at certain period of your life, probably 
around four, six months or for 11 months for peanuts, according to some studies and that have been recently reviewed, uh, meta-analyzed in the paper of JAMA, show that you can induce antigen-specific tolerance. So you eat egg, you protect it from egg allergy, not from a fish or other allergy. So it's a very specific prevention of food allergy by giving your by giving oral antigen in a certain period of life, at least a period when you eat already solid food or you're capable to eat it. And, and the studies in the mice show that, okay, it's good to expose orally. It may be good to expose orally to induce prevention, but this may not be sufficient. And in particular, the group of... Um, uh, Mackenzie showing that having short chain, uh, having vitamin A uh, can help to induce oral turns and antigen specific prevention of food allergy. And another group so also that short chain fatty acid produced by bacteria also helps. So, of course, we also always start by a very specific question, and then you can see that you can improve by adding other molecules, such as metabolite produced by bacteria or vitamin, like vitamin A. Again, what's going on with this little pup, which is not supposed to be exposed to solid food, and how will it have a maturation of its and impact on its gut immune function while it's not receiving solid food. And of course, the and question goes to the breast milk, so of, or in utero. Uh, here, I would like to, to mention a study performed also in the mice showing that retinoic acid and vitamin A uh, nutrition uh, in the mother is important for uh, lymphoid organ development and that vitamin A is really critical to drive the um, ILC3 um, development as well as stromal cell organizers, organizer, organizer cells secretion of uh, cytokine that will be critical for lymphoid organ formation. And um, now about the diet-derived antigen in early life. So how are you? You okay? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. So I, I will have a drink. So to, to, to summarize, we have seen that microbiota can directly impact on gut immune development. Few studies in the neonate, it can act because microbiota metabolize some food. In particular, it can produce indole derivative and short-chain fatty acid. Antigen in the diet have... Uh, impact on the regulatory tone, and this is shown in adults. We saw that the mother microbiota can produce indole derivative, and also can, thanks to HMO, can, produce, can give a short-chain fatty acid to the neonate. And so let's go now to the, the focus of research of the, the team, is uh, how can we induce oral turns, antigen-specific oral turns in a neonate. So as I was telling you just before, if you give uh, antigen, which may be a little bit surprising, but if you think it's something that you could envisage, it's giving directly egg antigen to a one-day-old mice. So people have thought this may be something that can be done, so they test it. And they find that it has no impact on oral turns. It can even prime the immune system. So you certainly understand this is not physiological at all for a neonate to get, receive solid food at day one. And you see that the immune system is not ready to cope with uh, a high amount of antigen given that way. So uh, we developed... Uh, 10 years ago now, a model where we gave a, a food antigen to a lactating mother, and we measure the level of antigen in breast milk, and it was very low. It was in the range of one nanogram per ml, 
And you know that beta-lactoglobulin, for instance, in, in a cow milk is in the range of milligram per ml. So we are absolutely not in the same range uh, when we, we deal with exposure to antigen in a breastfed neonate. And we wait that the mice is six weeks old, so that's nice compared to the human. You only wait six weeks. And then you check, we check the allergic disease susceptibility, either respiratory or food allergy susceptibility to see the impact on local immunity and systemic immunity. And this is something published now a while ago, but I, I will just briefly uh, come back to it. What we found is that you can uh, induce oral tolerance, prevent allergic disease systemically by giving to a mice, not a, a mother, uh, not a human, we found it in the mice, by giving a, a egg antigen to a lactating mother, you can prevent allergy, but the allergen only is not sufficient. And here comes the breast milk. You need the, you need the TGF beta from the breast milk to ensure that tolerance induction. So all, while in the adult, just giving egg, egg antigen can induce tolerance, in the neonate, you need the cofactor from the breast milk to have that tolerance induction. And um, this illustrates this uh, unit that, in fact, the mother milk is complementary and complement the so-called immunodeficient immune system of the neonate, as it can, it, otherwise it can't mount a roll tolerance. And we next wonder uh, whether the maternal immune status can impact on oral tolerance induction, just to mimic the fact that you have allergic or non-allergic mother, would it make a, a difference? And so um, Eric Moscani was a PhD student uh, analyzing this. So this is the initial model. We found that uh, antigen anti-GF beta could induce tolerance. And a few years later, we were capable to show that if the mother is immunized, you then have immunoglobulin in the milk binding to uh, the antigen, and those immune complex are now very well captured uh, by the epithelial cell. The transport of antigen is protected, and you have very strong protection mediated by FOXP3 T-Rex that are known to be important for turns. What was also interesting that it took a few years to understand in this case, what kind of cell were mediating torrents, and it was not FOXP3 T-Rex, but TH1 cells. So this illustrates that by different way you reach torrents, uh, not always <coughs> the same kind of torrents, but uh, milk can, by different way, achieve the same goal by different ways. So if you have antibody, you have FOXP3 T-Rex torrents. If you don't have antibody, you also have torrents, but by TH1 uh, mechanism. And the more recent work uh, by Mathilde Tufkoyer was to check whether um, <clears throat> you, there is an optimal period to expose the breastfed neonate to an antigen to induce protection. So what we did is that the, the mother was exposed to egg antigen during the first week of lactation, the second week of lactation, or the third week of lactation. And we check if the protection, the prevention of allergy was, was the same. And you can see here that uh, when mice were breastfed by exposed to mother during the first week of life or the second week of life or the third week of life to egg, and you assess when they're adult the allergic inflammation in the airways, <coughs> you see that we can prevent uh, respiratory allergy by giving egg antigen to lactating mother only if the mother receive it in late gestational period. In the very first, peer, uh, in the beginning of lactation, early exposure is not uh, working, although you have TGF beta and other uh, factors important for turns. So we thought it may be a, not a problem of the breast milk, but a problem of the neonate in the first week. So we assessed the gut barrier of a neonate, and as others have shown, we found that the neonate gut barrier was leaky, and, and you can see here the in vivo transfer of a protein across the gut, and we measure it in the serum, and we saw that uh, when you give uh, an antigen during the first week, you find it at much higher level at week one than if you give it at week three. We also found that uh, the neonate had um, 
neonate means we analyze at day four, and we three we analyze at day 17 or 15. We found that uh, if you look at dendritic cells in the lamina propria, which are important for production of retinoic acid, as you remember, very important to drive immune response in the gut, the, the neonate has a poor capacity to metabolize vitamin A into retinoic acid. And we also find that uh, the, the dendritic cells from a neonate uh, from the mesenteric lymph node were poorly capable to stimulate T cell proliferation and differentiation. And so uh, why is that so? We will come to the vitamin A. Uh, in fact, we measured the level of uh, retinol in the serum of mice and that were day four days old or 15 days old, and we found that the level of vitamin A in the neotel mice was very low. So I don't know if it was very low. I found those values, so I didn't know if that's very low or not low. So I asked people uh, of the biochemistry lab of the hospital, and Nice is a region, that's all that has been done in Nice, uh, was I, I was working there, and... Um, in this, we eat very well, and I ask what are the values that are accepted for uh, the lab value that you accept for retinal level in the serum. And here is the curve I, I, I receive, and you can see that the minimal value that are accepted are considered as normal, uh, very low at, at, uh, at birth, and uh, in preterm, as uh, you certainly know, are uh, even lower. So the, the value we, we find here in the day four mice are quite comparable to the one you find in a human neonate. So it looks like it's a conserved um, observation that you, you have low vitamin A in the serum of a neonate, and we can discuss this. And then you will find many other papers showing that. So we wanted to further investigate the road of vitamin A, and we supplemented the mother which were, however, fully had a very healthy diet with enough vitamin A, but we gave them extra vitamin A. And this way, we could uh, increase the retinal level in the serum of our day four old mice. And then, in fact, we accelerate the maturation of the immune system of the neonate. We found that those mice receiving vitamin A through the breast milk, had a stronger gut barrier already at day four, more developed it crypt. The dendritic cells were not capable to metabolize vitamin A, and the DC dendritic cells were also capable to activate the immune system. So to summarize this with a scheme, we found that in the mice, the neonatal mice, has physiologically low vitamin A level, and this is associated with the leaky barrier, and it's also associated with the poor capacity of dendritic cells to activate T cells. And in three weeks old mice, they have in fact received vitamin A through breast milk. So now the level of vitamin A in the serum is normal for, uh, compared to the adult. And in that case, uh, you find that uh, the gut barrier is now uh, uh, much more strong and dendritic cells much better to activate. And if we give supplement of vitamin A to neonate through breast milk, we found that we have now a neonate that is uh, aged and comparable to a three-week-old mice and now also capable to mount torrents, be protected. So from all that, we come with some uh, hypothesis. And um, we heard this morning that vitamin A deficiency is a serious public health issue. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to propose the idea that uh, vitamin A deficiency, the physiological deficiency, so the normal value for a neonate, which, but which are low compared to an adult, may be a contributing factor for allergic disease in Western countries. And so there is one paper uh, analyzing this in, um, in Finland, and it's, a, it's not an intervention study, it's a, a publication looking at association between level of retinol during the first months of life and the risk of atopic sensitization. And they find an association between low level of vitamin A and risk of allergy. Okay, so that's in Finland. But if you go to uh, 
uh, Guinea-Bissau, there has been an interventional study uh, where neonates are supplemented at birth with 50,000 <coughs> units of uh, vitamin A, and the risk of allergic disease is evaluated, is evaluated at year 10, and they find that in the female only giving supplement of vitamin A was increasing the risk of allergy. So how do you reconcile our mouse study, the clinical observation in Finland, and the one in Guinea-Bissau? I think a major difference is that in Guinea-Bissau, you have endemic enteric infection, so the gut mucosa is inflamed. So all the immune response are going in the direction of inflammation. And now you give a you want to induce torrents, and you give vitamin A. In fact, you will not induce torrents. You will promote inflammatory immune response. So this is a hypothesis. Um, I would be happy to test vitamin A supplementation in a country with not endemic infectious disease um, to test whether it could help. So how much time do I have? Well, like five minutes? Five minutes? And so, um, so to summarize, uh, we found that, uh, again, the breast milk accomplished what I would say magic function because it will bring anti dietary antigen to the neonate, and in addition, it will bring factors that complement uh, the deficient <coughs> immune system of the neonate, and in addition, it brings factors that will mature it and at the end allow or allergy prevention, at least regulatory function. Um, I think I will pass this. Up. And just to summarize, what we, we know a lot about is that breast milk can prevent infectious disease, and this is certainly uh, because breast milk is uh, bringing mucosal uh, passive immunity. Uh, our studies and also the studies from Ime Pentila show that breast milk brings immunoregulation and also with oligosaccharides. But we also find that in addition to bacteria that can promote a, a gut immune maturation, vit vitamin A is important to favor immune development. We found that antigen transfer through breast milk can educate the immune system at a certain period of time, and vitamin A can help in that education, and this can lead to immune tolerance. And uh, the two, three last minutes, I will talk then to you about the research we've been doing now in the last four years on uh, house dust mites, and I will go to the take-home message. And so, how's the smite? Why do, should I talk about how's the smite when I talk to you about early life nutrition? And that's because, in fact, um, we, I will, if you want, I will explain why we, I came to that hypothesis. But I came to the hypothesis that how's the smite may be present in, in human breast milk. And indeed, that was the case. And... Uh, I skip all that. And as you can see, if you analyze the, the presence of an allergen of house the smite, the P1, uh, you can see a, around 100 picogram per ml of house the smite allergen, the P1, in colostrum from Brazil, France, Australia, and also in more mature milk. And this is found in comparable level to a neg antigen. So yes, you can find a respiratory antigen in the milk. And in fact, we found that it was also present in digestive fluid of healthy people. So derp is in fact mainly, how this might is mainly ingested and, and doesn't go to the lung because these are big particles. So they are mainly going to the gut. And I think we should consider it as a dietary antigen to see um, impact on gut immunity, and this is what we have been doing. And just to summarize, we find that uh, mice exposed to house dust mite during lactation period and in, were in fact more susceptible to allergic disease, and this was shown for the lung infection, uh, inflammation, so mice receiving house dust mite through breast milk are more susceptible now to respiratory allergy. We found that egg was preventing allergy. We found that having house dust mite in breast milk is promoting allergy. So this is a very bad news. And it's not only a study in mice, because we did now uh, association 
study uh, looking at level of how's the SMIT antigen in human milk and risk of respiratory allergy in five years old children and atopic sensitization. And we find that having high amount of DERP, I mean high is 50 picogram per ml. So I think homeopathic has a big career with uh, human milk because it's uh, really important to see the level of antigen that can prime immune system for long term. So uh, we found it was thus associated with higher risk of respiratory allergies. This is for the next time I'm invited. And so uh, to, to conclude, uh, just look at this. <laughs> we found in the mice, and we have some evidence in the human, that giving an allergen by oral route can be a route for sensitization, and it's not only inducing tolerance. So we now have moved the mind in the, okay, give everything by oral route, you induce tolerance, no. Uh, certainly not with house the smite and uh, maybe other allergen. And this also can maybe taken into account to think about uh, other factors that are modifying gut immunity, that are the bacteria, that are the dietary antigen, and there is also house the smite, that has been with us for a million years, and I uh, join again, Alan. We had uh, House the Mind with us, and it's important. It's important for sustainable development. It recycles our skin, our nails. It's important. And we survive very well, but in the last 30 years, we, we don't live very well anymore with House the Mind. So something has changed. And so that's one of the last yes, uh, slide. This you, you know, and you know also this, you know that, and we also know now that breast milk is uh, that magic because it can induce whatever you want. It can induce torrents, it can induce priming, and you may also find this a bad thing for prevention of allergy, but of course we're ambitious and we want to counteract that, but we would also like to exploit this and think that, okay, you can stimulate immune response orally by having an antigen in breast milk. So, of course, we propose that we may maybe vaccinate uh, children through breast milk. This is something I hope to do in the next 10 years. And for prevention of allergy, we have identified a factor that's not for today, but uh, I hope it will be published soon. We find that uh, gut, at least how the smite in the gut modify immunity has long-term impact, and now we are looking at how to counteract that by uh, giving a, um, intervention to the mother or to the neonate. And then that was the talk of today. And here are the summary, um, but I will leave. Just you remember, breast milk is bringing a bread to the neonate, allowing him to have short-chain fatty acids, which probably have an impact, but this has not been studied. Breast milk is bringing intel derivative that when you are m older, you can get from bacteria or from your solid food. And uh, dietary antigen are important because they give a regulatory tone and in addition can induce antigen specific uh, protection and breast milk is bringing factor that will increase this possibility. That's for some antigen, but not for all antigen and in particular how the smite is priming the immune system. And I thank you a lot for staying alive. <laughs> about 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for your wonderful presentation. So you talked about uh, allergy exposure in the lactating period. So can it be done in the early pregnancy? Because we know the critical period of pregnancy when the fetal genome is programmed. And all we know that maternal diet influences the newborns or the following baby's uh, food habit. So there is some experiments giving mother a carrot juice throughout the pregnancy. It was seen that during weaning, and the baby shows preference to carrot. So if we uh, expose the mother in a low dose to allergen in the early pregnancy, does it work better than the lactation period? Um, well, as I say, we, unhappily, we have to focus because each 
question takes like three, four years to be answered. So um, I haven't looked at pregnancy, but I know that you find an dietary antigen in amniotic fluid, and also how the smite antigen have been found in amniotic fluid. And this was published in The Lancet in the year 2000. So I'm, I, I think that indeed, certainly in the human, which has already an immune system more mature in, in utero, can probably certainly be already uh, influenced by this. But uh, in all the experiment we did, we take naive pups, so we exclude all what did happen in utero, and they are exposed only to breast milk to the antigen. So I co totally exclude your question. Thank you, I'm thank sorry. You. <laughs> So I have a question in terms of you, you spoke a lot about the sort of metabolic products, but you didn't really talk about the microbiome itself. And you know, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that, but in terms of direct interactions, for example, we know bifidobacteria has been shown to increase IL-10 expression. So. Yeah, but, uh, well, this is not my expertise, but I think it can go through the metabolites because how do you explain bifidobacteria in juice IL-10? So some, some pe people have shown, for instance, that polysaccharide from mm -hmm. uh, bacteroides is capable to induce IL-10 mm -hmm. and, uh, and stimulate T-Rex directly. Uh, others show that it goes through short-chain fatty acid that induces those t that TGF beta. But I, I think um, currently... Um, I'm not doing that much on microbiota, but certainly, of course, it interacts. And uh, having that, you saw in the adult model, it has been shown that having clostridia can help in inducing tolerance, probably because it brings those short chain fatty acid that bring IL-10 or TGF. So yes, it's not one factor that is magic. Okay. Bruce. So how generalizable is the dust mite phenomenon? Mm -hmm. So that was perfectly benign for a million years, you'd say, and, uh, and now uh, it's a problem. Is, is it specific to dust mites, or virtually all of the antigens that were benign before are now priming uh, <laughs> at, at, at the level you said, picograms? Yeah, uh, what we, we can say that is we find that egg antigen is not priming, it's inducing torrents. We know that house dust mite is priming, and we know that if we inactivate the protease from house dust mite, uh, in that case, we don't have protection, but at least we don't have priming. So we are identifying the factors in house dust mite that are contributing. So um, then you wonder why the protease of house dust mite in picogram per ml are activating the immune system while you are eating protease. And that have no impact. So this is really a, a, a mystery. But at least we know that uh, having protease inhibitor uh, could counteract that, and maybe other way that are more uh, that you may. We are also looking at how to modulate the bioavailability of that house. That might okay. The mother is exposed. It goes to the milk. How do you interfere with all this transfer? How do you control it? What I can tell you is that there is absolutely no relation between the environmental exposure and the level in breast milk. Uh, so that's very important because after the publication, I saw on blog mother saying, oh, we should uh, uh, take care of how that's might. I saw it's dangerous. No, no, no. There is, so I'm happy to publish as soon as possible that they can keep how this might around them. It doesn't change anything. <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't live anymore well with them. I don't know why, <laughs> but that's the way it is. That's a lovely talk, Valerie. Really. It's really great. So I have um, two different questions, and I'm, I don't want to be too picky about this, so I'm just going to ask the first one and see if there's time there's a second one. So the, the first one is more of implications of the basic science and clinical study design and pu from their public health interventions. And I just want to probe more to understand where you think the science and public health are intersecting. So, um, as you know, exclusive breastfeeding has been the standard from WHO and so on. There are those who are in allergy who are then proposing this should be the standardized, as a trial that was done in Britain, a standardized introduction of allergens to the baby directly between four to six, which would change that public health recommendation. Or there's the possibility, right, in other studies, yours and others, 
to um, uh, give it to the, the allergen by consumption from the mother, and then it's conveyed through milk. So do you have any sense of really how the relative effectiveness, the relative um, um, appropriateness of these different strategies, and also with something like egg or peanut or something, you know, yeah. is there any variation in these allergens in the way from place to place that that would matter? What I, I can say from the studies I have conducted in mice and what I have read is that um, it's hard to induce tolerance in a neonate, very hard. So uh, even people, the group of Weiner, looking at prevention of EAE, he tried to prevent EAE in rats by the same protocol, and he could not in a neonate. I show for egg, but it's the same for EAE. So it's hard to induce torrents. And we gave egg, and we modified an amount. We were not capable to induce it in the first week of life. So that's one thing. So it means that very early on, doesn't matter if the mother is exposed or not. It's probably, according to the attainment mice, later on that it's important that it's exposed to breast milk. Well, it doesn't do anything in the first uh, week. Uh, so maybe um, it would correspond to four to six months period in the mother, lactating mother. It's at that time that she should be exposed. And I have now data with um, Susan Prescott and Debbie Palmer that show indeed that at four, six months, having egg antigen is associated with protection. But we don't have enough N, a number of, uh, of, of um, cases, but it goes in that direction. Now for how's this mind, this is a... Another thing, it works very well from first week of life. You can activate the system. And, well, I think it's, again, evolutionary uh, uh, thing. It's allergy and tolerance is not a problem for survival. What is a problem for survival is its effector mechanism. And so it's probably important that the neonate, in case of a danger, so now how is the smite is considered as a danger by a neonate, and can prime the immune system. And we see that at week one, they are really primed. So um, I, I would suggest that the mother eats what she wants during the first months. It would not change anything. <laughs> and the late phase of uh, lactation, it could uh, induce torrents as long as you don't have too much house that's mite in your breast milk. Thank you. Yeah, so, okay. Good, thank you. So um, I'm very interested in pursue the interest in the FU2 gene and its upregulation. And what's understood, and you were kind of um, at the edge of some of that mechanism, IL-22 um, expression through uh, ILC3 mm -hmm. and the micro microbiome or specific microbes. You're really alluding to here lactobacilli. So yeah, that's you know, what I some yeah. some of the, the, the question really ha has to do with how specific um, is, is it to lactobacillus? Is this a really um, more a you know a set of a variety of microbes that, that this is one example of? Yeah, that's what I. This is not something I have done. This is something I have read that lactobacillus is particularly uh, um, capable to metabolize tryptophan, but. Maybe the microbiota expert can tell if uh, other bacteria species can do it. That I, I, I certainly read that this is one bacteria that is capable and shown to be uh, effective in that metabolism. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.